Division One is now in session. Good afternoon. Please be seated. Thank you for your courtesy. This is the time set for oral argument in our case captioned uh, Cynthia Beckett and David Beckett versus the Noren Spine Center PC and others. Cause number CACV 14-0041. Uh, as, you, as you will recognize, we have uh, reviewed the briefs, we've uh, discussed your arguments, we've thought about them, and we've conferenced the case, and I think we're probably ready for your, for your argument. Uh, we have received uh, just, uh, I don't know, a couple of hours ago, the notice of supplemental legal authority from the defense side. I trust you all got it. And uh, uh, we haven't had time to study this in great depth, but we have at least uh, taken a look at it. Uh, if, if each of you, whoever's going to argue, will, will state your name for our recording, please, we'd appreciate it. Uh, if you wish to reserve time for rebuttal, you need to watch the clock and tell us, and we'll try to honor that. And uh, with that, uh, uh, counsel for appellant, Ms. Murphy, is it? Please <coughs> proceed. May it please the court. My name is Kirsten Murphy, and with Hannah Porter, I'm here on behalf of Cynthia and David Beckett, the appellants. This case ar arose out of a surgery that um, happened in 2009. The case itself, as it exists before the court today, is not about the surgery itself, um, but it's about an infection that occurred after the surgery. But to provide a little bit of context, I wanted to walk through some of the relevant um, context of the case. Cynthia Beckett had a significant, a major spinal reconstruction surgery in 2009. Following the surgery, <clears throat> she was highly medicated, in significant pain, as she would, would expect from a major back surgery. Uh, she had a wound site on her back that she obviously could not see herself, nor was she stable enough to view. Um, she, because of her condition and the pain that she was in, she required care from certain family members, her son, her sister, her husband, and a friend in Flagstaff. She was discharged from the hospital um, here in Phoenix at St. Joe's and was taken up to Flagstaff to her home. Over the next couple of days, for, she was discharged on a Thursday, I should have said, and over the next couple of days, her condition did not improve. Her family members reached out to her medical providers through their office, through their ser uh, telephone service. She, she went home on a Thursday. On a Friday, there was a call made to Dr. Crandall's office. In fact, Your Honor, I think she she stayed in uh, the Phoenix area on oh. Thursday evening. Okay. A call was made on Thursday by her sister uh, because there was some issue with the wound and um, care for the wound at that time. She was then taken back up to Flagstaff on Friday. Sounds like I'm a day off. <laughs> when you say care for the wound, are you saying that there was already a problem developing or they were just trying to determine how to properly care for that wound? I, I think if I remember correctly um, in, in, from my review of the transcript that there was that because of her back brace that I think that the bandage may have slipped and exposed the wound or there was some, some issue with the, um, the way that the wound was bandaged and so they called the doctor. I think um, both Mrs. Beckett's son and her sister, um, neither of whom were medical professionals, reached out to the doctors to say, I, I'm observing this wound, I see that there's an issue with the bandaging, and um, required some direction from the doctor's office on, on what to do so next. So as of Thursday evening then, when they left the metropolitan area and headed up north, there was no reason to believe there was cause for concern? Well, I don't know that that's the case. I think there was testimony in the record that demonstrated uh, while Mrs. Beckett was in the hospital that there were some um, indications that, um, and there was evidence on both sides of this issue, um, whether or not she had a fever, what her white blood cell count was, that there may have been indications at the time she was discharged that would have been indicative of an infection. Um, but in any event, they did take her up to Flagstaff on Friday, and over the next couple of days, her husband or her sister reached out to the medical providers on a couple of occasions to ask about her condition. I think there was also an issue that 
um, they uh, were supposed to have some home care that was um, at their home and that was not prescribed for them or it didn't the home care didn't materialize as it ought to have and so Mr. Beckett was on the phone with Dr. Crandall's office. When uh, Mr. Beckett or uh, Mrs. Beckett's sister, who again were reaching out to the medical providers because Mrs. Beckett was in no condition to do that, uh, when they reached out and expressed their concerns about her condition, the, the level of pain, um, the fact that she wasn't didn't seem to be going in the direction of getting better, but that she was in fact um, going downhill, um, the advice that they were given was increase her pain medication, make sure the wound is, cl is clean and dry, and bring her to the office in Phoenix on Monday. Um, they abided by those instructions, uh, except that on Sunday, Mrs. Beckett had a particularly bad day, and uh, Mr. Beckett reached out to another doctor, a local doctor in Flagstaff, who came to the home on Monday morning, and upon seeing Mrs. Beckett and inspecting her wound, he directed Mr. Beckett to call, to have the ambulance come and take her and transport her to Flagstaff Medical Center, which he did. When she arrived there, <clears throat> and, and I should say, her testimony um, was that she had very sporadic memory of the events um, as we get closer to Monday, and she has no memory of her first nine days at Flagstaff Medical Center. Well, um, I realize you may have a little more to say factually, but I'd like to move us ahead into the legal issues of course. if we could. Uh, uh, wh why isn't her signing of the consent document uh, an assumption of the risk of infection. I'm so glad you asked. Uh, the the so, in order to assume a risk, Arizona law requires that it's a subjective test. The plaintiff has to have actual has to have knowledge, subjective knowledge of a particular risk. The risk at issue in this case, and it was it was clear in the jury instructions. It was clear during counsel's argument. The risk that we're talking about was the doctor's negligent failure to diagnose and to treat her post-surgical infection. So, so you're saying that she assumed the risk that there might be an infection. She that, didn't assume the risk that the doctors might have been fell on below the standard of care in diagnosing and treating the infection. That's absolutely correct. There was not an issue about um, whether or not Mrs. Beckett was aware of the risk of an infection occurring. She was. And sh there actually was not an issue about um, whether anyone was at fault for the fact that the infection ultimately did occur. And, the, and the, the basis for the argument of assumption of the risk is the f informed consent form. Is that correct? As I understand it, based on what the uh, on counsel's objection below and the trial court's response to that objection, and in fact um, defense counsel's test or argument below, that the basis for the assumption of the risk was that Mrs. Beckett, whether it was in the consent form as the trial court suggested or in discussions with her doctors, um, I think defense counsel said there were four different instances where they talked about consent. It was consent to the risk of. A potential for infection, but not to their negligent care. But the, um, I'm assuming that under the, I guess it's the Snowball case that says um, if you're going to ask, assuming that public policy would allow assumption of the risk of someone else's negligent, you better have that in the consent form, in the assumption of the risk form. And, and in fact, Your Honor, um, Dr. Crandall was asked about whether or not yeah. that was in the okay. consent form, and he said no, it wouldn't be. And that's consistent with public policy that a patient could not assume the risk of negligent treatment from her health care providers. Um, and so on, the, on that issue, to, f to further that, um, because there was no evidence demonstrating uh, that Mrs. Beckett did in fact assume this particular risk, um, nor as a matter of public policy and, and the law could she have assumed away um, her provider's medical negligence. Uh, the only result is that the court should reverse the verdict below. Let's say we agree with you hypothetically that at least that there was no evidence to support the giving of the assumption of the risk instruction. Why is it reversible error? Wouldn't the jury have followed its instructions and not gotten there, finding no negligence? 
Well, I think what what the Arizona cases say, and a couple drafted by um, my one of my favorite justices, Justice Lockwood, <laughs> say that there must be in order for this instruction, even though there's a constitutional provision that um, that provides that in assumption of risk and contributory negligence cases, those instructions go to the jury, um, unless you have, and the term is substantial evidence on each of the elements of assumption of risk and contributory negligence, those things are not to go to the jury. And the reason is because um, it, uh, it taints the entire deliberation and could lead the jury to assume that there are certain things in existence that, when in fact they're not. And I think that's illustrated in this case where the jury could have assumed that Mrs. Beckett could have lawfully, um, you know, under Arizona law, assumed away the risk of her doctor's negligence. But isn't there an instruction uh, given, and I, I confess I, I, I didn't uh, take the time yet to go and look at the totality of the instructions, but as I recall, there usually is an instruction that says words to the effect that, you know, some of these instructions may not apply if the facts aren't, if you find the facts in a certain way that, you know, some some particular instruction or class of instructions may not even be applicable. Well, uh, if they found no negligence, then this one wouldn't be applicable. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure it uh, jumps out at me that that it would mislead the jury. Well, and I think, I mean, I think part of the issue is in the cases I reviewed, I did not see anything to suggest that um, giving the, an instruction not supported by the evidence would be harmless. Um, in fact, the cases say the opposite, that giving the instruction um, alone, you know, it, itself is reversible error. Every time. It, based on the cases that I reviewed, yeah, with respect to assumption of risk and contributory negligence, yes, that's those cases say if the instruction is not supported by substantial evidence, it is reversible error. And, and again, taking into account the totality of the circumstances, if you look at all the jury instructions, I think the contributory negligence instruction compounded the error. It alone, by itself, um, constituted reversible error as well. Let's assume we felt that the comparative fault, I'll, I'll use the word comparative fault instruction, um, wasn't erroneous. Um, you're still saying that the, uh, the assumption of risk um, instruction requires reversal? Yes. Each is an independent basis, but certainly together they compound the error. Okay. And with respect to the contributory negligence instruction, um, there again, the defendants at trial had the obligation to provide substantial evidence on each of the elements of negligence. Their, their argument there, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is that, is that uh, Mrs. Beckett and or her relatives who were helping her uh, uh, should have should have sought medical attention sooner after after being discharged. That's how I understand the argument as well. Um, but I would say that the two facts that are relevant to that issue, whether a reasonable person in Mrs. Beckett's position, and it's only Mrs. Beckett's potential alleged negligence that's at issue. What her husband or her friend or her sister did, they were not non-parties at fault. Mr. Beckett was a party, but his fault was not at issue um, in the jury instructions. Um, what I would say about that is the two facts are, one, that um, Appley's own expert, their standard of care expert, actually testified that he found no uh, criticism with how Mr. Mrs. Beckett or her family handled her post-operative um, actions. And um, the second, which I've now lost, but um, I think... I'm glad that happens to somebody yeah. other than me. <laughs> you previously um, stated that when called they were told to wait through the weekend and come in on Monday, correct? Yes, that's correct. Was there any intermediate action to be taken? For instance, if the, became, if the pain becomes so bad this evening that she can't take it, immediately go to the hospital. Was there anything short of wait 72 hours? Well, I'm actually glad you said that because that was my second point, which was <laughs> that um, her, her caretakers, mm -hmm. uh, her husband and her sister, um, their step was to consult with the doctor and to rely on the doctor and the doctor's office and, and that was the instruction that they followed. They apprised the doctor of her condition and they relied on the advice that they were given. Now because the instruction was come to Phoenix on Monday and because they, they watched her and observed her and didn't think she could make that trip, that's why they reached out to the doctor and Flagstaff and, and that's how that came to be. And my question, what I want to be real clear on, is not that they didn't take intermediate action but they weren't given direction to take any intermediate action by the physicians that are at, are at issue in this lawsuit. That's correct. They were not given any intermediate actions besides taking more medication 
keeping wait the Monday. wound and wait till Monday. But it, but it seems to me, although maybe I would agree that the evidence of contributory negligence, I'm not talking about assumption of the risk here, but maybe the evidence of contributory negligence is thin, maybe. It, it does seem to me there's some, because an argument can be made, you know, something should have happened sooner from the patient's end. Uh, may, and maybe that's not even a very attractive or, or persuasive uh, or endearing argument, but if the defendants want to make it, they, aren't they entitled to? And, and, and isn't there just enough there to, to warrant that instruction at least? Well, I would say that there's not um, because um, in, in looking at Mrs. Beckett's negligence, the only testimony regarding the um, proper uh, regarding the standard of care, I guess, if you could say it, or what a reasonable person would have done, was from the appellee's own expert. Uh, but the other issue with contributory negligence, oh, and I, I don't uh, want to... Excuse me for interrupting, and sure. if you can remember your other issue, yes. that's great, uh, after, after I've interrupted you. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know that expert testimony is necessary for things that, that we generally consider common sense. And, and I consider it a, at least a, a matter, to some extent, of common sense as to a patient's home from the hospital and, 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 and if you're getting dramatically worse, uh, you know, it's time to go back. Well, and I would just say that in, in the medical malpractice context, I think it's the Salika or Salika case suggests that expert testimony is required, especially with respect to causation. And that was my other point, which was that there was no evidence of causation. But, but there, is, there is some evidence that sepsis gets w worse the longer you delay treatment. A matter of fact, I think we've ruled in a, in a related case that where the doctor could be liable for malpractice because of sepsis, where there was some kind of delay in treatment, we found that there was evidence that, and there was evidence in this case, that sepsis will get worse or develop into sepsis. An infection will develop into sepsis. That's correct. Medically correct. The longer it's delayed, and that seems, treatment is delayed, and that seems to me to be enough for the causation. Well, and I guess I would just say when you're looking at the, the patient, it is the patient's actions, the patient who was highly medicated, who was in and out of consciousness, who could not reach out to her medical providers herself. It was her negligence that was at issue. But that and as to her that's conduct. All, and that's all appropriate for the jury to consider. But I guess I, what I would say is that there's the, uh, there is no evidence that Mrs. Beckett herself, that Mrs. Beckett as a patient did anything to prolong her um, before she went to the hospital. Instead, she relied on others who called her providers, the providers advised the provider, or excuse me, she relied on her caretakers who called the providers, the providers gave advice, the caretakers followed it, and the only evidence regarding what a reasonable patient would have done comes from the Appleby's expert who said, I, have, I find no criticism of the way she handled it or her family members, and, um, and that, that's the, the sum of the evidence um, with respect to a reasonable person. Now, there's a lot, there was a lot of argument, aggressive argument below about um, the fact that Mrs. Beckett is a nurse. Um, there's a lot of argument about the fact that Mr. Beckett is a nurse, that her caretakers were a nurse. It was an appropriate argument that could not be used to form a basis for, uh, as evidence against Mrs. Beckett the as a reasonable patient. The instruction just based on whether, what a reasonable person would do, right? The instruction itself read reasonable person. The instruction did not um, uh, raise the standard of, of care. Um, unless there are any other questions, I... Did you, another, did you have another issue you wanted to address? Um, the, the only other issue was the so-called stipulation. I think that's adequately covered in our briefs, unless you have any questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> May it please the court, my name is John Egbert. I represent uh, Dr. Forseth, one of the Appley doctors at the table with me is Lori Vopel. She represents the other doctor. Uh, we plan to, as we did with the joint brief, um, that my argument will cover both. But if for some reason something comes up in the course of this that uh, Ms. Vopel feels that um, she needs to have a, a minute or two, or then we'll, uh, my plan is to then uh, give her that, that time. I want to start, Your Honors, with the, the first issue that was discussed so far at this argument with respect to the assumption of risk. Our position is that we should never get to the merits of that, um, that issue at all because it's been waived. 
The, the objection, you argue, was not good enough to preserve it. The, argue, the, yeah, the objection, and they concede in, on page 18 of the reply brief that the objection on the record did not detail the specific grounds for the objection to assumption of the risk, end quote. They say it was made in chambers and then renewed, but, but we don't know what was in chambers. And as far as I know, this court has consistently said that, that objections to um, instructions and objections generally need to be made on the record. We, and we, we have said that, but in this case, the judge seemed to indicate what the objection was and so that it was he was made aware of the nature of the objection to the assumption of the risk your honor i i i read it. I, I differ with that reading i think that's an that's a reading between the lines that's a fair perhaps a reasonable inference but that's not um that's not how we do things in terms of preserving objections mm -hmm. and it's unfair to i think give that inference or take that um make that <coughs> inference um, because it could have, it could mean something else, and I think what? that, pardon me. What might else it mean? Well, uh, clearly they did object to the uh, the contributory negligence that that wasn't sufficiently supported, and um, you know it may have been a a lumping of to, lumping together of 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 the uh, instruction objections. Um, th there are any number of ways. Again, I, I think that the judge's comment, um, it, he doesn't say, you, you, you know, state for the record, you asserted this objection that assumption of the risk was not supported by the evidence. That's nowhere in his comments or in their objection in the record. And, and I, but he does, he does indicate in response to the objection where, where, where counsel, I think, had referred back to the in-chambers off-the-record discussion. The judge did indicate, as I understood it, that that uh, uh, that that the evidence was sufficient to warrant the assumption of the risk instruction uh, based on the forms, uh, which I assume includes primarily the implied uh, uh, informed consent form uh, that that Mrs. Beckett signed. It, it, does, it doesn't that indicate the judge knew they were. They were challenging the sufficiency of the evidence to support that instruction. I, I I don't think it necessarily means that, Your Honor, and that that's our point. What else could it mean? Uh, again, uh, as I say, for the, the judge could say he, he's referring to he, we're, we're talking about objections, and clearly they they have objected with respect to the contributory negligence, saying there's not it's not supported, mm -hmm. and the judge comes back and he says. Look, there's, there's clearly enough evidence for the contributory negligence. I'm going to give that one. And I think there's enough evidence for assumption of the risk. I'm going to give that one, too. Um, that doesn't mean that they objected on that basis. It could mean uh, that they objected on some other basis. I don't even know that they made an objection. They assert that they did. I, I wasn't there. I'm appellate counsel. Sure. And so, I, again, I, I think if you're going to. Not as clean as we'd like. Uh, uh, I, and I would say it's not clean enough. So that's our position, and you, you've heard me out on it. Um, with respect to the follow-up backup argument in terms of is, assuming that it wasn't waived, um, is, is there, should this instruction have been given at all? I, I, I would go to two cases that I think are important and instructive on this, on this issue. And the first one is the, the, Firebird, the Phelps versus Firebird case, and the second one is the Estate of Rhinen case. I'm sorry, Judge. Go ahead. I, I understand. I think I understand your argument from your brief about the Phelps Firebird case. But as I understand it, in Phelps, clearly, I mean, let me let me set the let me set the premise. Is it your argument that the assumption of the risk was based on the informed consent? Yes. On the form. Yes. Okay. So that's it. Yeah. That's what we're dealing with. Okay. Um, as I understand it, there was no question in Phelps that there was some kind, there was an issue of, okay, did you assume the risk, and there was some evidence of that. The question here seems to me to be that in, that the form doesn't say, I assume the risk of my doctor's negligence. It says, I assume, the, I assume a risk that there may be, be, an, may be an infection. And if there's no evidence that there was an assumption of the risk of the doctor's negligence under the snow the, the Phoenix the Flagstaff snowball case. If there's no evidence of that, the A Tumbling T case seems to me to make it very clear 
that if you don't have evidence to support an assumption of the risk uh, instruction, the instruction should not be given. Your Honor, that's why I, I suggested there's two cases that you ought to take a close look at. And the second one is the state of Rhinen. And when you, when you look at the two uh, pieces of those cases, I think combined it, it answers our question. And let me just refer to the language. The first is the Phelps case where it says, there will almost always be factual questions about the scope of the express contractual assumption of risk, which must be left to the jury. Then the Rhinen case says, Thus, the presence or absence of assumption of risk are matters exclusively for jurors to decide. That's at um, paragraph 18 of the Reinen case. M my point is that it's just as much a constitutional right of the defense to have this issue go to the jury as it is for the plaintiffs. Fair enough. Fair enough. But let's take that argument to its logical conclusion. You don't have, and let's assume hypothetically, you're representing a doctor and there is no assumption of the risk form. But for some reason, the doctor decides, and there's no evidence of assumption of the risk. The doctor decides in his answer to assert assumption of the risk. And it is, or her, um, a joint pretrial statement says assumption of the risk. But there's no evidence presented. Okay. Assumption of the risk. Okay. Are you saying that on that basis the jury has to be assumed? No. Be, be, why is that? But you just said that you just said the absence of assumption of the risk, whether there's an absence of the assumption of risk, has to be given to the jury. So why is it that if there's no, so why is it then there's a limit as long as there's some evidence of assumption of the risk? The, the, the leap is that your hypothetical says there's no evidence, and I accepted that as true. Here, I don't accept that there's no evidence. I think that the consent form, their argument is, is a great argument. Look, this, this consent form means only X, and their argument is that there is no assumption with respect to the diagnosis and treatment. It's only that it might happen. Can Snowball say that? Snowball says, if you're gonna if you're gonna ask us if you, the defendant, putative defendant, are asking me, the plaintiff, putative plaintiff, to assume the risk of your negligence, that form better say that. You can't just say, well, I'm assuming the risk of any harm, or I'm assuming the risk of infection. If you're saying that you're assuming my my neg the risk of my negligence, it better say that. Counsel, is every informed consent form an assumption of risk? No. Every time, every time a patient goes in and is treated and signs off on informed consent, is that an assumption of the risk? No. Because I'm looking at the informed consent, and I don't see anywhere in that informed consent form where it says I assume. Well, well, let, let, let me. Let, I, I'm, I'm not sure I understood your question, Your Honor. But uh, I'll read it to you. Is every informed consent, or every informed consent form, does it act as an assumption of risk? It. I, I don't know the answer to that. I think in most cases it does. How would we tell the difference? How would we how would we look at an informed consent form and say, yeah, this is an assumption of the risk. This one is just an informed consent. Well, it, uh, uh, the reason I, I said I, I held back and said uh, that there may be some that are not is that it wouldn't be assumption of the risk if it if it was completely unrelated to. In other words, the the. In this case, if it if it the in, the informed consent said nothing about infection, therefore it would not be an assumption of of any of these issues that we're talking about. No assumption of the risk about infection or diagnosing or treating infection. So anything that mentions anything that mentions infection is an assumption of the risk that the doctors may misdiagnose or mistreat, and there may be problems that you cannot pursue them for. Yeah, you're, you, I, that's, I think that's the, the argument that we're making, yes. Okay, but you said a minute ago when you were citing uh, Firebird or Reinen, excuse me, Reinen or Phelps, that there needs to be an express contractual assumption, right? No. No. Maybe I, maybe that, that, I, that's, that's what the Phelps versus Firebird, they were dealing with an express uh, assumption in that case. So, so we have express assumptions, we have informed consents, what else do we have? What, what does this fit into? If it's not an informed, it's not an informed consent strictly, you say it's an assumption as well. Yes, yes. And it's not an express contractual assumption. What is it? Well, uh, it is an express 
contractual assumption. When when somebody gives something in writing and they sign off on it, if that's an assumption of risk, it's an express one as opposed to implied. Can you tell me the language that is the express uh, assumption language? That when when she's informed that that a common uh, consequence of having the surgery is uh, contraction contracting an infection. Knowledge of the possibility of there being complications is an automatic waiver of all issues you may have otherwise with with your doctor's performance. Your Your Honor, I I, I won't say all issues because as I said earlier, some some you know. Some issues may be unrelated to what's addressed in the document, but if it's addressing it, then then there's an argument that that is an a, a assumption of risk, which under our constitution needs to go to the jury to be decided. Uh, you may have covered this, and if so, I apologize for not picking it up. But uh, in addition, in in addition to the uh, uh, informed consent form that Mrs. Beckett signed. Is the defense claiming there's some other evidence in addition to that of, of assumption of risk? No, no, Your Honor. I think we've we, okay. we're we're relying on the consent form. Sure, that was that was clear. I I, I think we can avoid some of those more difficult issues again by by requiring uh, that objections be made on the record, and then we don't need to get into that. So I'm going to move into. Um, very briefly, the contributory negligence piece, because I do think that there's clearly evidence there that there was, uh, that should have gone to the jury. Uh, uh, let's assume hypothetically that I agree with you on that, on, at least on the comparative fault issue, that there's some evidence of causation. I'm curious, if, if the judge gives the instruction that says, you have to determine comparative fault based upon a reasonable person standard. And you make an argument that the reasonable person is a nurse. So does that imply that she has a higher standard, a higher duty? No, Your Honor. I think the, the restatement provisions that we submitted earlier today um, address that in terms of it it goes to it's still the reasonable person standard but you take into account their knowledge you take into account all the circumstances that's what the reasonable person standard their, is including their knowledge I'm sorry including their expertise including knowledge and skills right so if the person's trained as a nurse you take that into account in determining whether they were at fault yes okay so I guess that leads me to the next question which would be if she's a nurse, don't you have to introduce evidence, expert expert witness testimony about what she should have done? Because you're you're trying to allocate fault. You're trying to allocate fault to her. And that's yes. that's fair enough. Yes. Um, if you do that, don't you have to have an expert come in and say, you know, as a nurse, she should have known X, and she didn't, you know, and done something. Well, a couple a couple points uh, are important here. One is that the evidence initially about her knowledge and her skills, her status as a nurse, was brought in by the plaintiff in direct examination. On, on different for a different reason, but I understand that. Different reasons. Right. Um, and the second point, Your Honor, is that we are the, the jury was instructed here. This is a challenge to a jury instruction, which said nothing about. Uh, her uh, being held to the standard of a nurse. It said a reasonable person. And the law, we believe, is clear that you can take into account knowledge and skills. And if they've touted her as having skills and knowledge of a nurse, then that's fair game. But you argued that too, right? We, we did, you argue did argue that. You did argue, I mean, the jury instruction on itself may be neutral, because it doesn't say anything about judging her, the, 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 her reasonableness based on her training. But you did argue that the jury should take that into consideration. But the appeal is not from a challenge to allowing argument. The challenge is uh, to the instruction. Was the instruction, should it have been given? And that's a different issue than, than okay. should, we, should we have been allowed to argue that aspect of this evidence that they presented. That's not been objected to and not been presented in the appeal. It, so that would be something that would be left up to the trial court. If we reversed on another ground, 
let's assume hypothetically, and we're keeping it open and we don't have made any decisions. Um, if we if reversed on assumption of the risk and didn't address the other issues, that would be something up for the trial court to decide how to handle. Uh, uh, yeah, a, a new trial would be a new trial, and then the court would have to decide how to handle all evidentiary issues. Absolutely. Yep, in, the, in that context. Um, finally, I, I do want to spend just a moment talking about the last issue, about the, the evidence. And that was one in which, um, I mean, that's an abuse of discretion standard. That, um, that this was a stipulation, right? This you wanted to bring in evidence that they had dismissed St. Joe's and another somebody else. Yeah, yeah, and, and they argue that that the evidence is irrelevant and it's prejudicial. And they entered into a stipulation that said, "This is what they they did." Yeah, and then and, you didn't do anything based on that. You didn't make an argument that if they did, did you make an argument that or did not you, but did your did the trial attorney then make an argument? Well, if they dismissed St. Joe's, it means our clients aren't liable. Your Honor, I, I, I don't. I'm not 100 percent certain, but I don't believe that that was that was okay. the argument so, that was so, made. And there's no instruction on allocation of fault to St. Joe's. No, there is not. That I know for sure. That's what I thought. Um, and 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 again, I want to emphasize that the the whole evidence about St. Joe's and Dr. Econopolis, or how you say his name, um, that that was started by plaintiff again in direct examination the first day of trial. And this was an effort by us to not have that be dangling out there and, and be you know prejudicial and confusing to the jury. So uh, we we don't think that this was an abuse of discretion by any stretch of the imagination or that it caused any prejudice or that it caused any prejudice we're saying you could you weren't you weren't pointing the finger at st joe's or dr e we were not we were not uh we would ask the court to affirm on all of these grounds and particularly we would ask the court to affirm that there's been a waiver with respect to the assumption of risk because i think that sends the wrong message to practitioners that um those types of uh objections are um, are sufficient. It's, it's, um, sorry. Uh, before you leave, Mr. Edward, uh, um, I, I, I was curious about whether any other state had had uh, adopted assumption of the risk as sufficient to go to the jury. And I'm not sure that we're particularly persuaded by what other states do, but but I was curious to see if any had found assumption of the risk sufficient to go to the jury based solely on an informed consent. And I was looking at some outside Arizona cases. Uh, do you happen to have any one or two great cases from outside Arizona to cite to us? I do not, Your Honor, and I agree with you that I'm not sure that they'd be particularly helpful given our constitutional uh, provision of Article 18, Section 5. I think we'll probably try to follow Arizona law. Uh, we would ask the court to affirm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think we should. Yeah. Thank you very much, yes, Mr. Edward. Absolutely. Ms. Murphy? Counsel, an infection, anything that mentions infection is automatically an assumption of the risk. Absolutely not. Um, there was no issue about informed consent, which is its own um, potential um, litigation over whether or not a patient was given informed consent. Assumption of risk is an entirely different analysis, which is a subjective test from the plaintiff's perspective, whether she consented to a, a particular risk, whether she knew about a particular risk, whether she understood the magnitude of that risk, and whether she then engaged in behavior um, that subjected herself to that risk. And the cases that I've seen across the country, assumption of risk in medical malpractice cases is typically limited to situations where um, a patient acts contrary to her doctor's advice. Um, it's not a situation where she simply was made, whether or not she was made aware of an issue, it's whether or not a doctor advised X and she did Y. Was there in the state of, were you done answering? Oh, absolutely. That's my question. Done I was done, yes. Okay. I'm in not done. <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> um, in the state of Rhinen, I was looking through the, the, uh, the opinion and it looks like the court didn't um, address what the uh, form was, what the basis was for assumption of the risk. It did, it did talk about the jury instructions on assumption of the risk, but it didn't say, and I haven't looked back at the Court of Appeals decision to see if it described it. Do you know what the, what the um, and that was a medical malpractice case. 
Do you know what the uh, the um, assumption of the risk form looked like? Or the informed I consent? don't. Without looking at it again, I, I just wondered if you knew. Okay. No, I That's don't fine. know. We can take a look. Uh, my, my question, uh, we hope to let you get to a brief uh, rebuttal in, in a few seconds. Uh, my question uh, relates to the waiver issue, and you've already addressed it. Mr. Egbert argued it pretty persuasively. Do you have anything you'd like to add on that? I do. Um, if you look at the transcript, um, again, there was a conference. I was not trial counsel either. Um, so, But if you look at the transcript, it appears there was a meeting in chambers and that Mr. Sheedy, who was trial counsel, came back on the record and said he renews his objection I made the prior jury instruction concerning Cynthia Beckett's negligence and assumption of the risk. He is renewing his objection on contributory negligence. He's renewing his objection on assumption of the risk. Is that In light enough, of that, though? Because the, is, that, that alone uh, doesn't say much on the record. Well, it, it doesn't say, uh, again, it's not a perfect objection, um, but again, it's renewing, you know, the parties were there, the judge was there, they were in chambers. The judge knew what he was talking about because when the judge talks about those two ob uh, objections to those instructions, he addresses independently evidence that he contends supports contributory negligence. Of course, we disagree. And evidence that he says supports the assumption of risk, which so, is the consent. So it's plan. the combination of the two. If the judge hadn't said anything, the judge hadn't said anything and just, I renew my objections. That might not have been enough. But once the judge said, okay, I find there's sufficient evidence on contributory fault, comparative fault, and I find there's enough evidence based on the form for assumption of the risk, that pretty much leads us to believe that that was, if there's a fair inference, that that must have been the objection. That's our position, yes. That's your position. Thank okay. you. Thank you both very much. We'll take the matter under advisement, and we'll be in a brief uh, recess now for the next case to come up. We will issue a decision in due course. Thank you.